Isn't it amazing that after 20 years of behavioral finance hacking away at the foundation of the efficient market hypothesis, that there is still no generally accepted alternative to EMH? And I don't just mean some better theory that they're looking at, but there is no theory that actually opposes the efficient market hypothesis. So people using behavioral finance and behavioral economics to challenge it are doing only that so far. They're challenging it. I'm going to try to put a little bit of a different twist on it today and see if we can get closer to a theoretical alternative. The efficient market hypothesis is elegant and internally consistent. There's only one problem with it, and that is it is not externally consistent. In other words, it's not consistent with the outside world, with reality. The essence of EMH uh, rests on two things, external cause, and number two, rational reaction. Now, behavioral finance has challenged the word rational. It says people aren't always rational. Very often, they're not rational. But they still mostly accept the idea that the market is priced based on external, external causes or, ex, or valuation facts or events that occur, and that people react to them, and that ultimately that's the way the market is valued. I'm going to challenge these much more fundamentally uh, today, and I'm going to start by challenging the very idea of exogenous cause. There are plenty of theories about how external events affect, for example, the stock market, and we're going to look at some of those. One very venerable theory is that Stocks compete with bonds. So the higher uh, the long-term interest rates are, the more attractive bonds are, and therefore the less attractive on a relative basis stocks are. Uh, this has been a theory around for over 100 years, and let's see how valid it is. Do interest rates move the stock market? If you knew the direction of interest rates for the next 10 years, would you know the direction of stocks? Well, here's an example of when stocks went down in a very large bear market. They were cut in half. Did interest rates go up? Were bonds more attractive for that reason? No, they went down the entire time, almost all the way to zero on federal funds. We've also got an, the opposite example when stocks went up. This was also quite recent. They nearly doubled during a time when interest rates rose. There's something terribly wrong with the idea that bonds and stocks are competing with each other on a rate basis. But of course, we've also got examples when stocks go up a lot as interest rates go down. One example is the mid-1980s. And there are times when the stock market goes way down and interest rates go up. So we've got four examples of what the market can do. And these are not minor examples. Every one of them, the stock market either doubled or got cut in half, and interest rates went down a lot or up a lot. So if you know the future of interest rates for the next three years, you don't know if the market is going to go sideways or double or be cut in half. You don't know. There's no reliable basis to predict the stock market if you know the direction of interest rates. Now, we don't, which makes it even worse. But even if you did have secret knowledge, you wouldn't know what the stock market was going to do. Now, let's look at something even more dramatic. What about the outbreak of war? A lot of people say, well, if a war occurs, this is what the stock market is likely to do. Is that true? Let's look at some histories. Here's a history of stock valuations during World War I. You can see that stock prices rose during the first part of the war. They fell during the second part of the war all the way to the end of the war. So up early, down late. What happened in World War II? Well, the exact opposite. Stock prices fell during the first part of the war. Then they rose all the way in the second part of the war until the war ended. Completely opposite profile. Then we have the Korean War, during which stock prices rose most of the time. And the Vietnam War, during which stock values declined most of the time. So again, four consecutive wars, four completely different profiles. If you know there's a war coming, you do not know which way stock prices will go. Now, some people might say, OK, war is an outlier. Maybe that's when things go crazy, we can't predict. But certainly during peaceful times, those are times when people can cooperate, they can trade with each other, business can be strong. We can rely on the stock market being yeah, powerful on the upside during peaceful times. And there seems to be some evidence for that. Here's an example. This is the 1920s, very peaceful decade. The stock market went up 500% during these very peaceful times. Unfortunately, of course, the following three years were just as peaceful around the world, and yet stock prices lost 89% of their value, retracing the entire bull market. So even if you know that the next few years are going to be relatively peaceful in terms of wars around the world, you don't know which way the stock market is going to go. 
What about political parties? People have written academic papers saying that, well, if you start at this particular date, we can show that this party in America, the Democrat Party, for example, versus the Republican Party is better for the stock market or worse. But that involves a little bit of data fitting. If you do take all of the data into account, starting when both of the current parties began, you find there's absolutely no statistically significant difference between the Republicans and Democrats in terms of what the stock market is going to do. Under Democrats, the average annual gain is 7%, and under Republicans, it's 6%. That's not statistically significant. Worse, even if you try to grant the Democrats a little bit of an edge on this basis, the result is not robust. You can take two years out of this uh, entire period, 1930 to 32, and it erases the advantage of the Democrats and actually puts the Republicans in advantage. So statistically, this is an irrelevant approach. There have been many, many papers written about it, but the true answer is you can't predict the stock market if you know what party's going to get elected. What about so-called shocks? Many economists have written papers full of equations, and in a small footnote at the bottom, uh, they will say, well, these will hold true unless there's some shock that we uh, can't anticipate, such as an oil shock or a terrorist attack or something like that. Um, is it true? Let's suppose you knew that for the next couple of years, the price of oil would triple. I think that would qualify as a shock, don't you? Well, do you know that it's happened twice in the last 15 years? On this graph, you can see that there were two times when oil tripled, and during that time, the stock market doubled. Now, where's the shock? It's not there. Now, look at the graph at the bottom. This so shows the correlation. Above the zero line is when oil and the stock market are going in the same direction, a positive correlation. And below that line is when they're going in opposite directions. You can see sometimes they go in the same direction, sometimes they go in the opposite direction. And as we all know, the stock market is a fractal. This, can be, this is 52 weeks. You could do it at 52 days, 52 hours, 52 months. You get the same picture. Sometimes they're together, sometimes they're not. It's, most people would look at that and say it's virtually random. So even if you have what's called an oil shock, it means nothing. You shouldn't throw out your equations if they're any good to start with. What about terrorist attacks? A lot of people say that would disrupt their models. And let's take a look at an, at an example. Remember in uh, 2001 was 9-11, the terrorist attack that uh, hit the World Trade Center in New York and uh, the Pentagon. At the time, you might remember, there was also a period when uh, a lunatic was sending around uh, envelopes uh, laced with anthrax. He killed a few people, very prominent people, in government and business. And people were quite worried about it. It was making headlines and everything else. Now, if you're an exogenous cause advocate and you look at this history I'm showing on this chart, you might say, well, it makes perfect sense. Look, the stock market was heading straight up. It was heading for a new high. And then the first anthrax attack occurred. Panic swept the country. And those arrows are when the other mailings occurred as well, and people died from those. And right at the bottom, you'll see we had a headline, anthrax fears fade. The guy stopped sending them. People weren't worried about it anymore. So it makes perfect sense from an exogenous cause point of view, doesn't it? There's only one problem with this history. I just lied through my teeth. This is when they actually occurred. The first attack was on the bottom day of 2001. They continued through the biggest rally of the entire period I'm showing on here, six months. And right after the peak, anthrax fears fade. Now, if you're an exogenous cause advocate, you'd have to say, and you believe that terrorist attacks are important, you can draw only one conclusion. Terrorist attacks are bullish. And look what happened when they stopped. The market crashed and went to a new low. So is that something you want to hang your hat on? I don't think so. Now what about inflation? Almost everyone agrees that inflation makes gold go up. It's simple physics, right? Uh, I was speaking at uh, Oxford University, and I asked for a show of hands. I said, if, if the base money supply were to triple, what would happen to the price of gold? And hands just shot up in the air. These are all finance students. And of course, I said, well, what do you think? And they said, well, it would triple. I said, well, sure, it's just plain physics. Well, here's an example uh, from 1980 to 2001, when the M1 money supply tripled, and our gold-silver index, this is an equal amount of money in gold and silver at the start, not only failed to go up, it failed to triple. It didn't even 
goes sideways. Look how much it lost, 83%. Okay, now look at that little dot on the upper right-hand corner. That's where the forecast would have had gold and silver index going. The difference between where it was supposed to go and where it actually went is off by a factor of 17, 17 times what people would have expected. Now, some might say, well, yeah, but then the gold went up later. Did it catch up? The answer is no, it didn't, because our base money supply is now up seven and a half times from 1980, and the gold-silver index is still down 20%. Now, some people say at this point, well, wait a minute, Bob, you picked a bull market peak to start that study. And I say, that's my point. A bull market is one thing. Physics and reaction to money supply is something completely different. It's not there. What about QE, when the, when the central bank deliberately inflates the money supply in order to keep prices up? Certainly, that should be an exogenous cause that ought to work. Well, this is a history of gold up until the time when the Fed announced that it was going to buy $1 trillion worth of bonds and mortgages every year for an unspecified amount of time. They said, we're not even going to give you a deadline. We're just going to do it so we feel like stopping. The people that owned gold and silver at that time were, were just beside themselves with elation. They finally got what they'd been predicting all along, insane inflation, and they thought gold was going to go to $10,000 an ounce, silver was going to go to 200, and even that they said, there's no cap. This is unlimited inflation, never done before. So what did we put in our publication? Because we think differently, and you're gonna see why in a few minutes. This was our headline published shortly after that second announcement. Quote, the biggest inflationary Fed commitment in history provides another selling opportunity in the metals. And that's what's happened since. So QE, you can't even, you can't even rely on that to predict where your markets are going to go. Exogenous cause doesn't work. Exogenous factors do not regulate financial markets. And I would challenge anyone to pick any exogenous cause that you can re rely on and we'll test it. Data from the real world then are inconsistent with EMH's causal claim. Not just the rationality portion, but the very idea of external cause making the market go up and down. News, for example. 